All right, hey, good morning, uh, good morning, North Greenville. I uh, want you to give the worship folks a big thank you for leading us. Great job all week. Great job all week. And um, hey, take your Bibles or your Bible app, turn to be turning to Luke chapter 10. Let me give you a couple of things. First of all, thanks for having uh, me this week. And it's been great to be with you as, uh, as always. And also want to, to thank your leadership. Uh, uh, from Jody uh, to Justin to Rich Grimm to President Fan, just realize what you have here is not normal. I want you to know that. I preached in a lot of chapels and at, uh, at uh, different colleges and seminaries in particular, and what you have uh, going on at North Greenville is not normal. And a lot of it's God using your leadership, but it's also your leadership prioritizing the things that God says he blesses, all right? And so he blesses his word, he blesses the mission of God. And so once you give your leaders a big thank you as well for keeping it. It's been a tough, been a tough, tough, uh, been a difficult 16 months if you are a, uh, if you're a leader, but uh, God has been gracious to you all. And it's uh, great, I count all of them as friends, so again, Thanks for having me uh, here. Here's, uh, I had about three different illustrations uh, to uh, start off, and I finally d- decided on this one because of what I saw in the front row, and it's this. Um, if you think back, be thinking about who your favorite uh, superhero is because what's happened is every th- a lot of stuff has changed. Tons of stuff has changed. Uh, l- last night I was sitting there, I was like, hey, I can't make tonight, but a guy named Shaq Hardy's going to come down, and I was talking to Jody. And I just said, hey, and if you need to, um, I mean, I can send you some tape on him, <laughs> some tape on him. And I was like, yeah, an eight-track tape or video, whatever. It's like, I can send you this. And he's like, really, really? How old school is sending me some tape on somebody? But you think about it, one of the things that has endured are superheroes. I mean, I was a kid wearing the Spider-Man pajamas, all right? It's like, that was my guy. I mean, the spider. Y'all still wear that? <laughs> okay. That's, that's kind of creepy, but I'm just saying, I'm just saying, Spider-Man pajamas, all right? I got a brother right here on the front row. He is wearing a Superman t-shirt, all right? He's, he's sporting it loud and proud. Superman is his, is his hero. A bunch of you guys are like, man, if I could have that, if I could make a difference, because that's kind of what's still the consistency. You go back to when I was a kid, even to today, superheroes are like still in vogue. They're still making movies, Spider-Man 8 or whatever it is. They're still lifting up a superhero, and people are still going to watch them. And I was thinking, why is that? Why do we want to go see that? Because something deep on the inside of us says, you know what? They make a difference. They make a difference, all right, whether they're Spider-Man or whether they're Superman or whether they're Wonder Woman or whoever. You're like, you know what? They make a difference. And probably one thing that has changed from maybe my generation and the generation before me to this generation is you go back to my generation or before and you looked at the surveys of what did college students want to have? What do they want to be? What did they want to accomplish? And it primarily dealt with, you know what? I want to get a good job. I want to be successful. Uh, I want to be able to provide good things for my family. And that was pretty consistent. But somewhere around 20 years ago, and believe it or not, it actually has made even a bigger jump in the last five or six years, is when they survey college students, number one, by far, to say, what do you want to do with your life? What do you want your life to stand for? And what you say over and over and over and over and over and over again is like, you know what, I want to make a difference. I want to make a difference in my world. I want to make a difference in my community. I want to make a difference to the people right around me. I want to leave a mark, not for popularity's sake, but I just want to make an impact on the people that I love and the people that God puts around me. Now, I'll say all that to say oftentimes we think it's some super spectacular thing out there that, you know, God's will for me is to go, and you have this massive plan. What I want you to understand, that is great to go for. But don't discount the fact that there's not a day that goes by that God doesn't want to use you. There's actually about three aspects of God's work in your life. It's the, he wants to show you the work he did for you. That's the gospel, that Jesus paid your sin debt. You don't add to that. You appreciate it. You worship God. But it's what God does for you in the gospel. That's one aspect. Second aspect is what God wants to do in you. Theologians call that sanctification. You know what? It's, it's the character development. It's the, what he wants to change you from the inside out. And usually people are like, that's awesome, that's awesome. But the third aspect, the one that takes the Christian life from just being checkmark Christianity to actually, you know what, God's given me a great purpose in this life, and that is not just what God wants to do for you and in you, but also what he wants to do through you. And there's a story that we're going to look at today. 
one of the most famous stories, but also one of the most misunderstood stories in all the Bible. Even if you didn't grow up in church, you probably have heard this story. And when you see a story, oftentimes what you want to do is, who am I in the story? It actually might surprise you who you are in the story. But in this story, it's not just misunderstood, but it's also very common. And let me just, let me start off. We're going to walk through it, and then we're going to talk about, okay, how do I make a difference? You know, Jesus uh, taught us, to, what do we pray? What do we pray? You know, on earth, do all these things on earth as it is in heaven. And I think today and what this week's been about is, God, would you ignite something at North Greenville University even more than you already have, and may your will be done at North Greenville University just like it is in heaven. And the way we know God's will is God's word, and in God's word, here's the way the story goes. Luke chapter 10. It says, and behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, teacher, they're talking to Jesus, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, when you think lawyer, don't think somebody who's like in litigation or chasing an ambulance or anything like that. A lawyer in this case was somebody who really knew the Bible super well, who knew the Old Testament, who knew all that stuff, which, by the way, is a great little understanding you'll see in the story. This guy knew the Old Testament super well, had most of it memorized, but yet he's sitting there talking to Jesus, the living word of God. And although he knew the written word of God very well, he was standing right next to the living word of God and didn't recognize him which means you can be at North Greenville and have Christian friends and Christian professors and listen to Bible stories and listen to Bible teaching all day long and be right next to Jesus and yet not know him. And so that's what you want to have. You want to make sure before you say, I want to go make a difference, make sure Jesus has made a difference in your life. And uh, here's the way it goes. And by the way, it's a great question the guy has. He's like, what do I do to inherit eternal life? I mean, that is a great question. How do I get to heaven? The problem is he's got a faulty construct but it's the, it's, the, it's the construct everybody has. What must I do to get to heaven? That is, people talk about there's all these different world religions. There's just two world religions, all right? There's a religion of what must I do, and there's a religion of the gospel of what has God done for me. The normal worldview is what must I do? Uh, because, by the way, everybody agrees something went wrong, correct? I mean, you're not, I don't care if it's Oprah. I don't care if it's, it's news. What everybody, nobody looks out today and says, man, that is functioning perfectly. Everything, every part is working awesome. Now, Christians, we understand our worldview is understand what's wrong with the world happened at the fall, and what goes on now is sin, and that makes the world not work right. But the question is, okay, how do you put it back together again? And you've got a bunch of different worldviews on that. I've got to do something. I've got to obey the five pillars. I've got to go to Mecca. I've got to meditate on the chakra. I've got to obey the law. I've got to do whatever. Uh, a lot of times, even in churches today, they take Christ out and they take the cross out of Christianity, and it ends up being just what still, what must I do? So again, the gospel is not what you do. It's what God has done for you. So here's the way the story goes. Verse 26, and he said to him, what's written in the law? How do you read it? Verse 27, and he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all of your mind and your neighbor as yourself. So he quotes the book of Deuteronomy in two different places, squishes them together, and basically summarizes the 600 plus commands in the Old Testament. If you look at the Ten Commandments one day, what happens is you look at those, they're divided into two sections. First one is love God. Second section is love your neighbor as yourself. And here's the way that Jesus answered. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Now listen to this. He says, do this and you'll live. Now listen to me. That's a pretty big do, correct? Okay. You can't tell tone in the Bible very well. There's a chance Jesus is being sarcastic here. It's like he's like, do this and you will live, wink, wink. In other words, love God with everything all the time, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, every minute. I mean, think about that. Love him with all of your heart. Love God supremely every minute of every day, all your soul. Care about pleasing him more than you care about anything else. With all of your mind, that means every time your mind turns to him, your mind thinks about what's on God's heart, your mind thinks about what's on God's agenda. True confessions, I can't even keep my mind on Jesus at five minutes on 26 at the wrong time, correct? On I-26, all you got to do to get my mind off Jesus is to put me behind somebody on a one-lane road with a Florida license plate, and I'm done. I'm, just, I'm done. I'm done. 
As I said the other day, it's like Christian cussing, which in the South, by the way, Christian cussing is, well, bless your heart. I mean, that's how we, that's how we cuss in the South. Just bless your heart, which means, you idiot, speed up, move over, do something. And that's, he's like, um, but he, he, he goes more, listen to this. He goes, and if that's not enough, love everybody else as much as yourself. Okay, just raise your hand if loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbors yourself, you feel like, man, I, that, that describes my last week 100%. That's all I did the last week is love God with all and love my neighbor as myself, their needs, concerned with their happiness. Because the truth is we can't even fulfill our own law, much less God's law. We don't. I mean, nobody has lied to you more than you've lied to you. I mean, how many times have we said, I will never do that again? I'll never do that again. I'll never do that again. And we do the same thing again. So, loved one, we can't even keep our own law, much less keep God's law. And so what happens is uh, we need somebody to basically take the test for us. And then think about it. I mean, God's test, by the way, is pass-fail. To pass, you have to make 100%, 100%. And so what we need is we need somebody else to take the test for us that can score 100, that can love God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength, that does love his neighbor just like himself is concerned with them. And so what the gospel is and what you're going to see, you, you can't misunderstand the parable. Most people misunderstand the parable. Most people understand this story as help somebody out and then God will let you into heaven. The story is not that at all. The story is not change your activity and God changes your identity. It's reversed. It's actually the opposite. God changes your identity and then the overflow of that is your activity then changes. And so here's the idea. Um, so let's just say, have you ever been in that place where, you know, your prof probably told you, hey, study this, study this, study this, and you thought you studied it, and you walk in there and you're like, I know nothing. I don't even understand the questions, much less the answers. And then you were like sitting there and you're trying to figure out some answers. You're depressed because it's not multiple choice, so you really don't even have a shot at the whole thing. And you got that one curve buster in the class, and you know he, you know she, they're going to make 100%. Every time, all the time. And you slink up there to the professor's desk and you're about to turn in your paper that's going to make like a 30. And then the smart one in the class, the one that makes 100% every time, meets you at the front. And you're amazed. And you're even more amazed when he says, hand me your paper. He scratches out your name. He puts his name on your failing grade. And it even gets better. He takes his 100% and then puts your name on it. That is the gospel. The gospel is you and I were going to fail. And then what got 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it says it made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Why? So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He takes your resume of failure and replaces it with his resume of perfection. And so when you look at this story, make sure you don't see yourself. Bottom line, the big picture is in the stories you're going to see, you're actually somebody different than what most people look at this story and see. So here's what happens, verse 29. And he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? <laughs> He's kind of feeling the squeeze of the commandment. Well, okay, okay, love him with, oh, who is my neighbor? In other words, let me lower the bar just a little bit. Who is my neighbor? But the bigger part I want you to see in that little verse is it says, wanting to justify himself. Now, the other day on Monday, you guys learned a big old word, propitiation, and you did awesome. And we talked about, man, if you can say macchiato, you can say propitiation, okay? And so great, great job on propitiation. There's one more word we're going to learn. It's called justification. Justification. Justification is a legal word. It's, it's the longer version of what he said right here. Justification is a legal term that if, when you embrace Jesus by repentance and faith, God declares you not guilty, not because you haven't sinned. It's not because you haven't sinned. It's not like not guilty like he didn't do it. It's called imputed righteousness. You got two choices when it comes to whether you're going to stand before God in a good place or a bad place. It's either going to be self-justification, which this guy's doing, or it's going to be God justification that he basically says, you know what, I'm turning in 100% paper, but I'm putting your name on it. And so again, don't miss the fact that have I actually understood the gospel and responded to the gospel? Because before we go to this little story about making a difference, has God made a difference in your life? All right, so he's like, who's my neighbor? So Jesus is like, all right, story time. 
and he tells the most famous story in the New Testament. Here's the way it goes. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. It's about a 17-mile journey there. And he fell among the robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, Levite's like a JV priest, all right? He kind of wants to be a priest, but he's kind of the JV team. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, now if you were a Jewish audience back then, they're like, because Samaritans and Jews hated each other. It was kind of a mixture between religion and racism all wrapped into one. All right, there's a lot of violence that had gone on. Jews would oftentimes sit there and they hated the Samaritans. Samaritans hated the Jews. There's one story in, in, in church history with the Samaritans because, you know, Jews hate pigs, which is amazing because bacon is awesome, right? I'm just saying, but they, they don't like pigs. And so one, there's this one story where the, where the Samaritans, during the time the Jews were worshiping, they actually get these pigs and they catapult them into, into Jerusalem, into their worship service just to mess with them. I mean... So you're saying it's not like a great relationship here at all. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him, and he bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on the animal and brought him to the inn and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, saying, take care of him, and whatever you spend, I'll repay when I come back. And here's the, here's the way he ends it. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers. And he said, well, the one who showed him mercy, and here's what Jesus says to him and he says to you, he says, you go and you do, you do likewise. So again, the point is not, let me do a bunch of stuff, let me do a bunch of stuff to earn God's favor. If you're a Christ follower, it's you understanding that in Christ you have God's favor and from the overflow of that, that changes the way I treat the people around me. The vertical gets right, and then the horizontal changes. And so you're like, well, how can I do it? I'm, you know, I'm kind of introverted, and I'm not a people, and I don't think I'm called to preach, and yada, yada, yada. How do I make a difference? Let me give you two things from the story. Number one is just see the ordinary, see or see the opportunity, see it in the ordinary. See the opportunity, and you're going to have this today. You're going to have this this afternoon. See the opportunity in the ordinary. Look at verse 31. It says he's going down a road. Again, loved ones, this was not some special road. This is an ordinary road. It's a road, he went, a road he went up and down all the time. This is I-25. This is Tigerville Road. It's just a road. That's all it is. It's not the yellow brick road. It's just a road. It's an ordinary road. So the question you want to ask is, where do I go just each and every day? What are my normal patterns that I go? What are the places that I go to? Where do I go every day? What coffee shop do you go to? Who's on your ball team? Who's in your classes that you rub up against? Who are the who are the people that, and we got a bunch of freshmen here. There's a bunch of scared freshmen trying to figure out, man, where's the dorm? I'm lost. I'm more lost than the preacher was a few days ago over at the other campus trying to find it. I'm lost. Who is right there? And it, here's the idea. Your opportunity that God's putting there is oftentimes right next to you. You're like, I'm studying to be a missionary, and I want to go over to, I want to go over to North Africa, and all that stuff is awesome. Just realize, realize there's opportunities right in your normal course of the day, and we miss them because we just get used to them. Um, something has happened. My wife is convinced that I had a bypass when I was a baby that if I go into the kitchen that I can't see things that are right in front of me. I don't know if this happens to anybody else. All right, I know we got a handful of husbands in here, and I'm just telling you, something happens to us when that happens, because I can find anything in my garage, I can find anything in my house, I know where everything is in my office, but I cannot tell you how many times I'm in the kitchen, I'm like, hey, hey, oh, hey, baby, where are those blueberries? And I have the refrigerator open, and I'm looking, I'm like, don't we have those leftovers or those blueberries? Are right? Well, it's right there in front of you, like, baby, I'm looking, it's not, it's not right here. Now, I've learned after about 30 times to look, you know, second or third time to make sure because it's embarrassing when she has to then come over and literally take the blueberries right from my eye line and say, love you, love you. I mean, here it is right there. How many times? Over and over and over again. It's right there in front of me, and I miss it. Listen to me. Hey, 
God's going to put something, even today, right in front of you. And if you're not careful, you're just going to miss it. You're going to walk right by it. You're going to think that's just an interruption. And you've got to understand a lot of times those interruptions you have, those are opportunities, divine appointments that God puts right, right in your path. I'll give you an example. Of, how many of you all been on a mission trip? Raise your hand on a foreign mission trip. I'm not talking about going to Cabo for vacation, okay. All right, so yeah, yeah, okay, a lot of you have. If you, you need to go, by the way, if you've never been, it just, it's awesome, it enlarges your, there's so many great things about it, but here's what you'll do, and those of you all that have gone, if you go on a foreign mission trip, you do a bunch of different things. Number one, you pray like the, you pray like crazy leading up to it. You pray, God, help me be sensitive to the needs around me. God, help me, you know, help my passport get back in time. All those things you're praying, you're praying, God, give me opportunities over and over and over again. Just give me the opportunity. And then you probably do some training, because if you're going somewhere, if you, you, you need to have a little bit, especially if the language is different. You need to be able to, like, say, you know, where's the Albano? Or you need to be able to say something to understand, i got to try to connect with this culture. So you pray, and you prepare, and you think about it, and you ask your friends to pray, and, and you're like, I want to be available. Listen to me. Hey, North Greenville, every day, if you're a Christ follower, for the rest of your life, you are on a mission trip. It doesn't matter where God ends up sending you. If you go to Detroit or if you go to Pakistan or if you stay near Greenville, God has put you for the glory of God and the good of other people. He says, you can make a difference right where you are. You really can. You don't have to be the preacher or the singer. Okay? God has put you on mission. Old Testament, it was like the priests and the people, and there was this big separation. In the New Testament, it says, if you're a Christ follower, you are the priest. You're the priest. You're the one that I want to use to make a difference in those people's lives. And... Um, Sometimes, again, you're just like, all right, God, don't let, me miss, don't let me miss what's right in front of me. But here's the part I really want to sit down for about five, six minutes on is you got to decide. You're going to make a decision. you got to make a decision to walk toward the mess because life is messy. I mean, honestly, you're, you're, not, you're a mess. The people around you don't know it, but you're, I'm a mess. I mean, really all the Christian community is a bunch of broken people, messed up people that have been saved by the grace of God and then cleaned and then sent out. But it's not a museum where everybody looks great in here. Imagine if everybody, can you imagine, I mean, there's stuff in here that if, you, if we stuck that thing up on the screen, you would be petrified. I don't want anybody to know that. Why? Because you're broken. All right. But the priest in the story, the priest sees it as an interruption. Those of you all that are in ministry, I know there's some of you all studying MDiv and all this kind of stuff. You gotta, this is like, your heart, by the way, is the X factor in ministry. It's not your preaching skill. It's not how awesome you can sing. It's not your leadership gifts. It's not all that. It's your heart. It says, above all else, guard your heart, for from it flows the wellspring of life. The wellspring of your whole ministry flows from your heart. You gotta guard your heart. But the priest, the pri- every indication is the priest is coming from doing his religious duties, and a lot of the religious people live down there in Jericho. So he's basically going from his church duties to his house. And it would have been inconvenient. There's a bunch of reasons for him not to help this guy. It's a dangerous road. Yeah, he probably was coming from where he was doing some purification stuff so that if he had touched this guy, especially if he was dead or if he thought he was dead, it would be very inconvenient, very expensive. He'd have to go back to Jerusalem. It'd take him about seven extra days so it's inconvenient. So he's like, you know what? Tap, you know, I'm tapping out. I'm not, I'm not doing that. Again, the JV priest, he does the same exact thing. Maybe he's watching the leader. We don't know. And then the Samaritan, again, all that racial tension in there. And they're just like, I, I can't do it. But it says the Samaritan, the Samaritan, and here's the word. It says he had compassion. He had compassion. Now, you all learn like if you're English, like onomatopoeic words, and that's one of these here. It's actually, it's kind of, it kind of sounds like, that sounds like vomit, but here's what it, it's like splagma. That's the word compassion, splagma. It means from the gut. You know how like when you, if you saw somebody that you really love really get hurt, you know, maybe they lost, a, they lost somebody and you can tell they're, and you hurt for them. That's kind of what the word means. It's like, ah, ah, that hurts. Which by the way, if the gospel is not continually renewing that, you'll get what's called compassion fatigue. Compassion fatigue is when you see that commercial years ago, you know, starving children, and then you can't turn away and it breaks you. 
but then you see it the next year and it doesn't break you quite as much. And then you see it the third year and it doesn't break you at all. And during the fourth year, you see a commercial like that. You get up and you go get a Diet Coke and then you don't even watch the commercial. That's compassion fatigue. And so here's what you see of this guy. He says he, he went to him. Well, don't miss that. I mean, thank God it doesn't say God so loved the world that he passed by on the other side. It says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. In this case, you have the hero in here. He takes a step. He didn't know what he's getting into. He doesn't know how expensive it's going to be. And loved ones, here's the core of following Jesus. The core of following Jesus is God changes your identity to a son or daughter of God through repentance and faith in Jesus. But it's not just, and here's the, the one, the problem, the only problem that oftentimes strong Bible-believing churches, institutions, the problem that you have to always watch is because we're trying to get so grounded in the word, we can go to a small group and go to a Bible study. We can go to a chapel. We can do all that stuff. And yet there's no outpouring of what God's teaching us. So we become like a cul-de-sac. We just go around and around. God says, I want you to be a conduit. I want you to be somebody that I bless through you. And so um, let me show you how this can uh, work. Because some of you are like, you know what? God's, I want God to use me in a great way. And uh, I thought about this story literally on the way down here. But there, some years ago, there's a famous picture that uh, I think got like top 100, pic- one of the top 100 pictures of all time. And what it is, it's a picture of a, there's a, there's a vulture and there's a starving child. I think they initially thought it was uh, a little girl and then they found out it was a little boy or vice versa. And so um, this photographer, he sees this, you see that on there. So you got the starving child, you got the vulture about 20 feet away. And what happens is he's feeling the tension. He wants to get the picture. But obviously there's an enormous need in front of him. And so what he does is he kind of, he's like, he's thinking about putting the camera down and going to help, but he's like, I got to get the picture. And they've told us we don't want to, you know, be careful to don't, don't touch the children. You might catch something and you got to be careful and all this kind of stuff. And so we wanted to, and he didn't, and he struggled. And eventually what he did is he took this picture and he sent it back to New York. And a few months later, he wins the Pulitzer Prize over this picture. And like four months after that, the guy that took the picture took his own life. And what all went into that, I don't know. What I would say, at some level in there, this would haunt anyone. I had a chance to make a difference. I had a chance to do something, but I chose instead to do something that would be successful, and I missed the whole idea of I can do something significant. Because you know what, bottom bottom line, in this story, you and I are not even the Good Samaritan. You and I are the beaten up dude on the floor. That's who we are. And our Savior came and bandaged us up, paid our debt, put us in a home, and then he says, but then he says what? You guys go and do likewise. So here's, here's, a, here's a challenge I heard from a good friend of mine last weekend, and I'll, just, I'll, I'll steal it from him. He said, listen, if TGIF is your biggest prayer, you're, doing, you're just doing it wrong. You're just doing it wrong. If TGIF is kind of like, I just, thank God it's Friday, thank God. If that's the biggest prayer you have, you're just doing it wrong. I would say maybe supplant that a little bit. Maybe a SDG, you know, solo de glory. It's like to the glory of God alone. That's what I think Bach would put at the end of every one of his compositions. It's like, I want this to be used for the glory of God. So here's a prayer I just want to, I prayed for you and I want to pray for you now. There's a prayer that I just jotted down that tries to sum up a little bit of, uh, of what we're talking about. Here it is. Um, Dear God, make me a servant today. Just make me a servant. Like, I don't want, I want to be saved. Be a servant. Help me to see people the way you do. Just help me to see people. Help me to hurt when they hurt. Take away the compassion fatigue. Help me understand the compassion you had for me. Guide me into the mess, not away from it. The rest of your life, you're going to have a choice on an almost daily basis. Do I walk into the mess, which is people, and do I walk away from the mess? And then the, the whole idea is for the glory of God and for the good of other people. What's, the, what's God's will for me? He wants you to live for the glory of God and for the good of other people. You're like, well, what about where? For the glory of God, the rest are details. 
Somewhere in there, you've got to put a stake in the ground that says, you know what, as a Christ follower, I'm going to live for the glory of God, the glory of God, the applause of God, not the applause of the glory of God and for the good of other people. You do that, man, you'll make an enormous difference. So let me pray for you. Um, just bow your heads. Father, thanks for, uh, thanks for the men and women in this room. It is unbelievable, the stories in this room. It's encouraging. God, I want to pray that that stamp of, you know, that, that part of the Imago day that, you know what, I want to make a difference. I want to help. I want to, I want to make a difference in my community, in my dorm, and on my team, and in my school. God, fan that, just like we talked about Ignite. Fan that into a flame. I've been praying at the very start of the week. God, would you send an awakening? Would you send a revival? Would you breathe new life? And God, I pray for these students right here that you'd use each and every one of them to understand that today they can make an enormous difference. That person at the coffee shop, that person that's serving them the breakfast, whatever it is, that God, just to love people for the glory of God. God, help them to understand every single day when they get up in the morning, they are loved by you and they are sent by you. In Jesus' name, amen. The students love you very much. It's great to be with you. Mr. Jody. Hey, if you've uh, enjoyed our Ignite Conference, especially Pastor Bruce, would you just give him a round of applause and thank God for what he's done. Yeah, we celebrate we celebrate what God continues to do in each of your lives, and we want to walk alongside you. Just remember, 864-800-6500, and we're looking forward to not just being ignited at this beginning part, but for the remainder of the semester. See you all next week, Monday, back in here at 10. God bless.